Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Paul Travel's uh, Virtual Travel Escape series. Uh, there's uh, so many of you, I, I know I'm one of them, that we're all kind of itching to travel these days. Uh, and with so many amazing and enticing destinations out there to experience. Um, Julie and I thought this is a great way to kind of uh, bring you uh, a little taste of travel. If we can't physically be there, uh, the next best thing is uh, virtually, so why not? <laughs> We hope uh, the series that we're doing is um, really um, inspiring to you and entices you to kind of continue to dream about where you want to visit to next and um, where you, what kind of experiences you want to have on your next holiday. So I'm Rhonda Spann, the Leisure Manager at Paul Travel, and my lovely co-host with me is Julie Beckdash. Good morning, Julie. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Welcome. So thank you all for taking the time this morning and uh, escaping with us and uh, having a little taste of Spain. Uh, I know we're both really excited to be sharing this with you all and um, we're welcoming back a, an amazing um, guest who's actually uh, joining us right from Spain. So uh, it's going to be a really exciting morning. So thank you very much. If uh, any of you are first timers joining us, welcome. Um, I know there's many of you have that have been following our series over the, the last, I guess we're on number 26, I believe mm -hmm. now. Already. So, I know, right? Isn't it crazy? So thank you so much. We really do appreciate your feedback and your, your support. And it's, it's really great that we're able to do this for you all. In case anybody has missed any of our previous webinars, um, Every, every one of them has been recorded. So you can visit uh, paultravel.com slash webinars and you'll find a whole list of our previously recorded ones. So um, it's a really great opportunity to kind of, you know, take a little time and visit a spot you might be interested in. So you can find them there. Um, if you have also, if you have any um, comments or uh, questions about any of the webinars, please reach out to Julie or myself. We're here. Uh, we're here for you anytime. So send us a little note. We're, we're happy to uh, answer any of your questions. Uh, so next week, um, we're going to be bringing you Colombia. So a little uh, trip to South America. So that'll be really good. Um, next Thursday again, November 5th at 4 p.m. Edmonton time. So join us then. I think it'll be really good. Everybody's on a listen mode. So if you want to ask any questions, please do throughout the presentation, just type them in the Q&A box. Um, Julie's going to monitor them. So we'll ensure that all of your questions get answered at the end of the presentation. And any comments too, put them in the, the chat box. Maybe you guys have been to Spain. You know, maybe you experienced a, a really unique um, uh, experience, I guess you can say, or a, a tour or a restaurant or something like that. So love to hear from you. So please uh, type it in the chat box. It'd be really great. So Julie, oh my gosh, I was thinking about Spain um, and the memories. That's one thing I love about travel is all the memories that you have that mm -hmm. you, you'll never, you'll never not have, right? So it just kind yeah. of you just think about, oh my gosh, like right now when we're sitting at home and we're like, oh, I want to get on a plane. You know, you think about Spain and I think about the amazing architecture in, in mm -hmm. Barcelona and, you know, Seville, all the, the Moorish influence and listening to the flamenco or watching the flamenco dancers and hearing that Spanish guitar, it just like, oh, transports me. It's so amazing. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? Have you been? No, I haven't been yet, but I would love to. I'd love, love, love to. So definitely high on my list. And I feel like uh, these presentations just give such a good time. Like we have the time now to like plan out trips. So I think that's what I'll do is Spain, plan out a trip. And when it's time, just kind of plug and play. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. Yes, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And so much, so much uh, to see. Love all the festivals and everything. So I'm excited to hear from Julia about it. So yeah. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Excellent. 
Um, well, I will uh, introduce now uh, back. We've had Julia on before, like Rhonda said, on she presented on Portugal and um, we got great reviews. And so we're so happy to have her back. So Julia, she is the Associate Director of Sales and Marketing for Made for Spain and Portugal, which is a destination management company that we um, we use and they help to create like she she we work with them to create really unique experiences for um, for you, our clients. And um, she is originally from um, the USA, from Pennsylvania, and she spent lots of time, uh, she grew up in a hockey family and spent lots of time in Canada for tournaments and stuff. And then she spent her, her adult life on the Iberian Peninsula as a travel writer, and then now she's settled in Madrid. So um, it's so nice to have you with us, Julia. I'm happy, I'm excited to hear about all your favorite spots and just get all the inside info from you. So welcome back. So much. So happy to be here. Welcome. So feel free to take it away. Right. And, um, take it away. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Can you share Any, yeah. here? If anyone's been, we'd love to hear again from you in the chat. All right. Well, thank you so much, ladies. I'm so excited to be here with you again and today sharing a little bit about Spain. Um, so as uh, Julia and Rhonda mentioned, we are uh, Paul Travel's partners here in on the Iberian Peninsula, both Spain and Portugal. And um, what we really do is uh, try to connect them and their clients uh, to Spain for insiders, Spain that you wouldn't experience on any tour, uh, just on a generic visit. We want you to fully immerse yourselves in Spain, see what your life would be like if you lived here for a time, if you moved here for tomorrow, and really see Spain through the eyes of a local. So that's what I'm going to try to share with you virtually today. We're limited on time, so I'm not going to go too deep into uh, all the details in the history. Of course, Spain has quite a bit of it, um, but just a little overview of the different regions of Spain, uh, the different ways you can experience it, and how we can uh, take uh, your experience a little bit above and beyond and a little bit more immersive. So first, the big question, why Spain? Well, Spain for such a, a small country is really chock full of uh, history um, from, uh, we have prehistoric cave paintings to the Visigoths, Roman times, um, up to the period of Al-Andalus and the Moorish influence and to modern Spain and everything in between. Um, so for the history buffs, it's a little bit of paradise. Um, we've also got incredible culture and art, uh, Velázquez, Goya, El Greco, Picasso, uh, Gaudi, all from Spain, um, and all can be visited and seen really in their home country and can't be appreciated any better than they can be appreciated here. Of course, we've got our natural wonders, the lush national parks, the mountainous regions. Um, we've got skiing, we've got incredible wildlife from bears to lynxes to wolves to whales um, to get a little experience of the natural wonders of Spain. Great for the hiking, the biking, and of course, our stunning beaches all around the coast. Um, and my personal favorite, the gastronomy. So Spain is known for our tapas, um, our small plates. Uh, they can be the most humble of plates to um, something at the Michelin star level. Spain is known for its plethora of Michelin star levels, home to uh, restaurants, home to the second best restaurant in the world, Taller de Can Roca, uh, and uh, just kind of everything in between. So if you are looking to eat and drink your way through a destination, Spain is certainly a place to consider. Um, so that's just a little bit about Spain, but let's go a little bit deeper. I'm going to take you by the different regions of Spain today. One of the coolest things about Spain that not many people know is that it's made up of 17 autonomous communities. So those are states, basically. Um, and each state really has its own culture. Some of them even have their own languages. Um, so you can't really experience one Spain. You kind of have to experience a plethora of the regions to really start to understand it and to get that, Span that Spanish uh, culture seeping into your skin. Uh, so today we're going to touch on all of those regions to give you kind of a vision and you can see which one maybe you connect with the most. Um, if any of them call to your attention, make sure to let us know at the end so we can discuss a little further. 
So I'm going to start today with Barcelona. Barcelona uh, is, I believe, a city on everyone's bucket list. Uh, it is just a powerhouse, um, known, of course, to be the home of Anthony Gaudí, uh, the incredible modernist uh, architect um, with his Sagrada Familia, uh, uh, along with many other works like the Parque. You have his, ho his houses, um, but the Sagrada Familia is certainly what he is most known for and will hopefully be finished in 2026. Six. We don't know with the craziness of this year, it might be pushed back a little bit, but of course you can still visit it. Um, and really understanding the importance of modernist architecture in the development of art in Spain, experiencing it in private, experiencing it with the architects who know and study um, under, uh, under um, Gaudi's um, students and um, really immersing yourself in uh, who Gaudi was. We can organize experience to the Guel family home. The Guel were the patrons of this park you see on the right, um, their home just outside of Barcelona. And the home is done all in a modernist style. So seeing that style in a private setting, um, it really uh, helps you to understand what that movement was and what the importance uh, of it was in the development of architecture, aside from just being visually stunning. Aside from the modernist architecture, of course, Barcelona is rich in many other, other things, um, being one of the most important ports in all of Europe uh, for many centuries. So the historical quarter is a can't miss. We have the Gothic quarter, we have the Jewish quarter, um, and we have uh, the Gracia quarter, which is where people have really flocked to, where the hip people are living nowadays, not in the historical quarter. So we love to combine those um, the different neighborhoods so you can see the history in um, in the center of the city but really also go out to where people are living and understanding what life is like as a day-to-day -day, um, Barcelonite uh, and uh, maybe visiting the different ateliers of the up-and-coming designers. Barcelona is the place to go for the fashion designers in Spain, going to a shoemaker to have um, to his private uh, studio and having shoes made for you, or maybe going to a hidden library, um, sorry, hidden bookstore, um, uh, library. The, the word for for a library for a bookstore in Spanish is libreria, which I always confuse with library. Um, library, uh, which has many of uh, Gaudí's copies of his private books, which are no longer uh, widely circulated. Um, so visiting that with a Gaudí expert is something very special, and uh, just getting to know once again the history with that sort of lifestyle and hidden story um, at the same time. Also, many other historical places uh, that are a little bit more modern. We have the Church of Tibidabo on the right, um, but that's just by uh, the old Olympic village um, from the 1992 Olympics. That is one of the most incredible uh, uh, pieces of modern art and modern architecture in that area where you can visit the, the FNAC Museum to, to see the modern art, the Jean Miro Foundation to see some cubism. Um, and also the installations from uh, the Olympics. It's just a huge uh, mixture and it's a great representation of what Barcelona is, taking its history and using that to launch it, launch it into its present. Another big draw in Barcelona, of course, is the soccer, the football team, uh, Barcelona, which is Messi. So, of course, you can organize tickets and VIP experiences and the gastronomy. Um, so Barcelona being the most cosmopolitan of all the Spanish cities, it's a huge draw. Um, for those Michelin star chefs to come up and their protégés, people that are studying under the Michelin star chefs and opening their own places. This is a great place to see the established chefs, but also those that are taking their first steps toward um, becoming iconic chefs. Uh, so you can get both of those experiences and the most humble of the Catalan food, going to the markets so with that we have our local host Regina here, who is a food writer in Spain, and she'll take our guests to the markets to meet the producers, to learn all about the importance of seasonal food in Barcelona, to see how to pick out of the seven different seafood stands in the market, how you pick the right one, um, and then maybe go back to her apartment, cook up the food together, and then end uh, in a different neighborhood uh, at her architect brother's home, where you can discuss Gaudi over dessert. Um, Barcelona is definitely a great place for foodies to experience uh, a full immersion of Spanish cuisine, but also especially that modern cuisine. 
And how can we forget Barcelona is right on the Mediterranean. So we have beautiful beaches. We have a city beach, the Barceloneta, which is right in the city, but also lovely beaches just outside of the city and the great weather year round. We have the fantastic rooftop pools, which is definitely key in choosing your hotel, making sure you can enjoy um, those warm Barcelona days and that sunshine on the rooftop pool, relaxing after a long day of sightseeing or eating your way through the city. All right, so Barcelona is the capital city of a region called Catalonia, uh, which is northeast Spain. And Catalonia reaches from Barcelona, a little south of Barcelona, all the way up to Andorra and to France. Um, so the important things to know about Catalonia which can be visited during a day trip or even adding a couple days on to Barcelona um, and staying in one of the more rural hotels uh, is nature, food and wine, and charming towns. This is what you want to keep in mind when thinking of Catalonia. Here we have Besalú, which is uh, one of the examples of the towns that seem to be totally carved out of rock. Um, it's just romantic and, and nestled within the rolling green hills and full of history, especially important to understand how Barcelona developed. It, it, we must understand um, the roots, which came from a lot of the small farming villages outside of the city, which you will see here in Catalonia. One of the biggest draws, of course, are the beaches here. This is the Costa Brava, which you may have heard of, the Brave Coast. Um, this is because a lot of the tiny, the best calas or coves are hidden. Um, and to get to them, you have to go up to quite precarious curves um, along the road and steep cliffs down, which we, of course, can avoid by organizing a boat to take you to the best calas or uh, having someone help you get down there. Um, and there are more accessible, beautiful beaches, but to get to the really isolated beaches, that's an experience in and of itself. But enjoying the crystal clear waters, the whitewashed towns, wandering through the streets, understanding the importance of the history of these towns, and just living the Mediterranean lifestyle, opening a bottle of wine, having uh, some fantastic seafood, even visiting Dali's former home, which is now a museum of his work. Um, you can kind of roll everything into one on this coast. And I, I think it's especially interesting to visit after you've been to Barcelona, because everything that goes on in the city sort of starts to make sense once you've been to this area. So aside from visiting the charming villages, uh, we've also got fantastic nature. This is where uh, the people from Barcelona love to come to spend their weekends, to go biking, go hiking. Here we have La Garrocha, which is an inactive volcano. Um, we love doing hot air balloon experiences here, but we can also do multi-day bike trips. Um, uh, just the rolling green hills uh, in you get to the peak and you can see the Mediterranean in the, in the background. It's just one of the most stunning experiences. And another big call to this area is the food and wine. Uh, the Seye de Can Roca, the number two restaurant in the world, um, three Michelin stars I mentioned before is located in this region, but it's also home to humble foods. The great thing about being right on the Mediterranean coast and having all this green lush farmland is you get the best of both worlds. You get amazing seafood, you get fantastic produce, and you get incredible meats as well. Uh, what you must try here is the fideuwa. It's like a paella, but with little noodles instead of rice. And the wine regions, you have to have a good glass of wine to go with. Spanish sparkling wine, which is from this area, or have a red uh, from one of the best wine regions in Spain. Actually, two of the best are here, the Penedes and the Priorat. So you're really spoiled for choice here. All right, uh, now let's move to Madrid, where I am uh, presenting from today, Madrid, the capital city. Um, so Madrid being the capital is definitely a historical destination. A history buffs can't miss Madrid. Um, it actually isn't as old as many of the other cities in Spain. It was made um, the capital uh, in recent centuries and uh, the city kind of unfolded around it. And it's very interesting to see how the Plaza Mayor, which you see in the top picture, that area was really the center of the city and everything kind of blossomed around it haphazardly at first, um, but starting here and then learning the entire history of the development of modern Spain. Of course, visiting the Royal Palace, which the Royal family does not uh, live there anymore, but it is used for relevance and it's just 
uh, luscious. I mean, gold everywhere. Uh, one of the most beautiful palaces I've ever seen and a must visit to the more modern parts of the city um, where people really live. And that's what we love to do. We love to customize a tour. So if we're with you in the Plaza Mayor talking about how this used to be the site for bullfights and we find out that uh, maybe you're very interested in that, we can take you to the atelier where um, the top designer designs the bullfighting costumes or um, you know we find out that you're super interested in fashion then we can take you to the shops in the Barrio Salamanca pictured on the left here um, really just customizing the tour to fuse all of your interests into one experience um, and that's the great thing about Madrid is that it really offers uh, things that span history and span interests. We have on the left here the Temple de Devot, which is a, a second century Egyptian temple gifted from Egypt to Spain. And it's on the top of a hill, the most incredible sunset. So you go there having the almost mythical, mystical experience of being in an Egyptian temple and seeing the sunset behind, maybe having a bottle of kava waiting for you or a picnic dinner there. Um, just something to really breathe in the city and its specialness too. Well, all that rich Spanish history that I mentioned before there in Plaza Mayor in the middle. And then we have modern Spain. So this is something that we're seeing a lot of interest in, uh, people having interest in. How is Madrid as a city uh, in modern day? How is it responding to basic things like uh, gentrification, pollution? What are we doing? One of the most interesting solutions to this is uh, the picture here on the right. This is a bridge in the Madrid River Park. So this park was built only a few years ago when um, there was a big separation between the center of Madrid and southern Madrid by a seven lane highway. And uh, the southern part of Madrid was becoming underserved because of that. It didn't have easy connections into the city. So the, the city responded to it by covering that highway, putting everything underground and covering it with a 10 kilometer park, kilometer long park. I play tennis there every weekend. It's stunning and such a resource for us living here. But the best part is it's a response to the social difference. So we have um, now these bridges all divine, designed by different architects, but uniting the two neighborhoods. So now the people in the Southern Madrid are have the resources that the people in the center of Madrid have, and it's had a huge response. So we can create a tour around that if you're interested in on how a modern city is developing here in Europe. And I can't leave Madrid without discussing the art. Um, we can really travel through Spain's history with the art here in Madrid at the Prado. Um, this is where you're gonna see a little bit of everything and the greats. I mean Velázquez, I mean Goya, I mean El Greco. They're all there. And uh, one of, our, ho uh, one of our, our guides, we can send you with an art expert. We can send you with an artist himself. We can send you with someone that's gonna take you back to his studio so you can paint your own picture um, from your inspiration in the, in the museum or even set up a scavenger hunt um, for the kids in the museum um, uh, to enjoy the classical art or head across the street to the Reina Sofia which is uh, the modern art museum. This is where you're gonna see a lot of explanation and start to understand modern Spain uh, with the modern arts. We have Guernica by Picasso here, but a lot of it is response to the socio-political developments um, since the dictatorship up until now. Uh, so if you're interested in the modern history, this is a place that you must go. Or to the tiny museums. My favorite museum is the one pictured right in the middle. That's the Sorolla Museum. Joaquin Sorolla was a Spanish Impressionist and his museum is, is housed within his home in Madrid. This beautiful mansion in the center of Madrid with a secret garden inside, which is one of my favorite places to go. I uh, would have had a, you know, a chaotic day and just kind of disconnect with running water fountains everywhere, this painted Spanish tiles, and then his artwork inside. So we can have his granddaughter take you through and share anecdotes of the family history with the heirlooms that are below the paint, uh, scattered throughout the home below the paintings that you might not have noticed while you're focusing on the paintings. So get the best of both worlds there as well. 
And the great thing about Madrid is you can really explore the heart or the heartland of Spain from there in Castilla. Um, so this is Toledo. Toledo is about 30 minutes from Madrid on high speed train. And it is a fantastic place to be able to understand the three cultures of Sp the three religions of Spanish history. We have the Moors, we have the Jews and we have the Christians, all of which cohabitated here in, in Toledo. And if you're interested in understanding how that works and the different influences of the different religions, um, and how that developed over the years. Uh, Toledo is certainly a camp's mess. We also have um, Segovia, we have Cuenca. Segovia was the home to uh, Isabel, the Catholic queen. Um, the castle, her home was uh, inspiration for Disney's castle. That might be why it looks so familiar. Um, but uh, visiting Castilla is key to understanding, especially uh, the development of Spain from the Moorish period, the reconquering, the Christian reconquering of Spain, because this is where the birth of that movement happened. So visiting Segovia, understanding that history, visiting Cuenca with its hanging houses, and uh, seeing what a small Castilian village is in that old way of thinking. Uh, so that's the best thing. You have these incredible castles, but these tiny towns where you can really see a Spanish lifestyle from maybe 50 years ago that still maintain and understand how Spain has developed over time, meet the local people, go for the saffron harvest, um, visit uh, the windmills of Don Quixote, uh, enjoy a bullfight uh, in the middle of a plaza, just really living and breathing the Spain of a small town, which many people don't get to see. All right, so now let's head south to Andalusia. Andalusia is home to basically everything we think of when we think of Spain. It's the birthplace of the tapa, of flamenco, of um, that Spanish uh, attitude of, well, I'm gonna enjoy today and I'll get to whatever I need to do tomorrow. A uh, very slow living. Um, it's home to some of the very best beaches. And also, of course, it was at a time Al-Andalus, so under Moorish control, um, as I think it was Rhonda mentioned, that's what she thinks of when she thinks of Spain, the Moorish history of Andalusia, and I'm the same. This is something that is so fascinating to me. And uh, you really see the adaptation of Moorish architecture into uh, the current architecture and understand how the basis, the, the Moorish basis of Southern Spain really set the tone for what Spain would develop into being. So Sevilla, Sevilla is a great place to start. That's the capital of this region. And this is where you're gonna see um, a lot of that Moorish architecture turned into uh, a Christian architecture. So on the bottom, we have the cathedral, which was once a mosque uh, and has now been turned, well, of course, it's a Catholic church now. And this is where Cologne's remains are, saved, are, are said to be laid. You can visit his tomb, uh, Columbus, Cologne in Spanish, and uh, the Plaza de España, where every single region of Spain is represented with the beautiful hand-painted tiles. Um, but Sevilla is also a modern city. It's a university city full of art uh, and um, it's a place where people really take their passions, uh, artisans, flamenco dancers, everyone uh, that has uh, really developed what uh, Andalusian traditions are, they can take it to that next level in Andalusia and modernize it. So this is a place to go um, to experience that. Um, a fantastic place to go for tapas. I love going with one of our hosts, Margarita, um, to her home to have an aperitif uh, and hear a little bit about what life is like in Seville and then finishing the night um, at the tapas bars around uh, having dinner and just being among the people. And the Sevillanas are some of the most friendly people in Spain and always looking to chat away uh, and share a little bit of their, their lives uh, with our guests. And then if you really want to get into the Moorish heritage, Cordoba is a must-see. Cordoba is actually the city with the most UNESCO World Heritage Sites in the world. <laughs> more than Rome, more than Paris. Um, it has four uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites. It has Medina Zara, which you see on the left, um, the former uh, Moorish city. Um, now the ruins, uh, we've got the mosque cathedral, which was one of the, this was the capital of Andalus during a time. So um, the mosque that was then turned into a Catholic church. And if you want to see the stark contrast between the, um, the Moorish architecture and then the Catholic development, 
this is the place to go. And of course, how is just around the corner from the Jewish quarter. So you really get to see all of those things. And um, uh, our guides are there to illuminate it for you and to share the secrets of this, of this city. Um, a city that you really can see everything in a day and it's an hour and a half from Madrid by train, an hour from Seville, it's really no excuse to be missed and it's something that people do overlook and I, for me, it is the gem of Spain. And then we have Granada. Granada for me is one of my personal favorites. I lived there for a time um, and Granada was the last stronghold of the Moors um, uh, before the fall of Al-Andalus and uh, the king living right there in the Alhambra. Uh, Alhambra known to many as the eighth wonder of the world. Um, we have, must organize a visit to the Alhambra and the Generalife gardens, um, which in and of itself are just an absolute wonder um, with the different, uh, just of Moorish architecture, but also the gardens and the smells of uh, jasmine through the gardens and the running water, the fountains everywhere and the views over stunning Granada, over the whitewashed Alabaythene Jewish quarter, over the caves where the gypsies once lived, over the Catholic cathedral where the um, Catholic kings are buried. Um, it really is just a magical experience. And Granada is the place to go to tapas. This is where uh, tapas were born. This is a place where you order a drink and you're gonna get a plate of food for free. Um, so this is a place to really to go to have fun. We love having clients join our local hosts. Um, to enjoy a few tapas and then maybe go for a nighttime visit to the Alhambra where you can visit the gardens under the stars, even hear uh, uh, live concerts, uh, Spanish guitar, and then maybe end up uh, at an underground flamenco show to end the night. Granada really is full of possibilities and just a place to enjoy. <laughs> And one of the most important parts of Andalusia, which some people, many people actually miss are the whitewashed towns, the Pueblos Blancos. The Pueblos Blancos are all over the hills of Andalusia and um, usually built surrounding a church or a palace stronghold. And this is a place where tradition is really held on to. So you can see old Andalusia, the hospitality, the importance of hospitality um, in the culture. Uh, you can see really just how this area of Spain developed from Moorish times until now um, with their tiny museums and even just walking along the streets with our hosts who can share the, the secrets around each corner and then ending up for lunch of um, maybe some fried fish and some sherry wine also from this region um, and, and sharing stories about, about Andalusia and life in a tiny town in, uh, in southern Spain today. And of course, we have our beaches. We have both um, Mediterranean beaches and Atlantic beaches in the south. So Mediterranean beaches like Marbella are more of the posh areas. This is where you're going to find the beach clubs, um, a lot of yachting, um, and of course, the, the pristine uh, Mediterranean waters. And then on the other side of the coast, Cadiz, which you have in the picture on the left, is a much more humble town. And these are where you're going to find the, the wild Atlantic beaches. Um, this is the windsurfing capital of the world. This is where the best tuna in the world comes from, Atun de Almadraba, which is fished in a very specific way that was brought over by the Moors. And we can take you out to experience, not experience because it's actually quite dangerous, but to see it up close. Um, and then of course, to taste that tuna. Um, it is just a, a, a powerhouse region and some of the most beautiful beaches in all of Spain. And you can get you can't miss the outdoor activities from hiking the olive groves, maybe setting up a beautiful table to have a tapas lunch with some sherry wine uh, in the middle of the countryside, or get out on horseback, um, experiencing the natural wonders of Andalusia, the Iberian lynx, perhaps going out uh, for a sighting. Um, that's something that can't be missed in this region. All right, I'm gonna take you up to Northern Spain now. Um, so this is a region for wine, food, and gorgeous architecture here. We have the Marques de Riscal Winery um, made by Frank Gehry. And uh, it's really emblematic of this region. This is, so this is a place where people are taking the traditions of winemaking uh, and uh, the traditional foods and elevating it, taking it to that next level. 
So uh, La Rioja is full of tiny towns and this is the, the tiny towns that have developed around uh, these areas where the best produce are growing. So the grapes are growing, where the fantastic vegetables are growing. Everything comes from the earth here. So visiting the tiny charming towns and understanding what their product is, what they're growing in this region, how they make it, um, allowing our hosts to take you into the homes of, of the residents and really understand how the earth gives them what they need to make a living and to produce the most delicious products um, that we've ever tasted, tasting that with them. And just understanding really how the family dynamic develops around, around this culture. Um, you know, heading out into the vineyards and picking the grapes yourself, stomping them, uh, having that experience from the vineyard to the bottle, uh, biking through, uh, just lots of, um, activities involve, that, that involve the earth and involve the, the produce that's, that's being made there. Um, and visiting the coast, heading up to the coast to Basque Country, uh, where we have these tiny towns, um, a lot of Game of Thrones filmed here for the Game of Thrones fans, but um, visiting the small towns and the rustic towns, everything in this area of Spain, this is North, Northern Spain. This is where it gets cold. It rains a lot. It gets snowy. So everything was built to be cozy so that you're going to duck into this tiny tavern when it starts raining down. Um, in the Basque language, they have uh, something like 30 different words for rain. Um, so everything was really built for the rain and to be able to enjoy life in the typical Spanish way, but in a rainy climate. So this is where you're going to get that really cozy, uh, rustic sort of feeling. Um, and then San Sebastián, of course, is the jewel in the crown of the Basque country. Uh, so this is the place with more the most Michelin star restaurants per capita in the world. Um, and also the place for pinchos, which are like tapas, but with the little uh, toothpick through them. You'll walk into bars full of the pinchos. Um, and it's uh, one of the most exciting gastronomic experiences. But the thing about San Sebastián is that uh, it became very popular recently. And so a lot of the places that used to be local are no longer. So that's why it's our job to take you to the under, underground spots, to uh, the places where the locals really are going now, to go to the gastronomic societies, which are traditional all-male cooking clubs and spending the day with them, um, cooking with them and enjoying a meal and, and learning about uh, life in Basque country. Maybe heading to one of the tiny fishing villages and heading out on the, on, on the fishing boat pulling in the day's catch and having it grilled for you fresh upon arrival to the shore, uh, or setting up a more exclusive uh, dining experience overlooking uh, the city on your private table. Um, and again, San Sebastian is that elevated cuisine, that's something that's put on your plate with tweezers, two oysters fetched freshly from the sea, to just casual tapas. You can really get um, the best of Spanish cuisine and uh, in all its shapes and forms in San Sebastian. And then getting to the nature, aside from what's produced there, it's also just the natural wonders in and of itself. This is the mountainous area, really big for hiking, for skiing. Um, and one of my favorite places to go hiking is the Oma Forest outside of Bilbao which you have on the right, which was painted by an artist and you're walking through the woods and suddenly you come upon uh, these glorious painted trees and it just feels like you're walking through magic. Um, uh, you know, the Basques just have this special touch throughout and a way to always surprise. And uh, so this hike is a great example of that. All right, now we're gonna head over to the coast before I take you to the islands, uh, to Valencia. Valencia, of course, is known for paella. This was the birthplace of the paella, um, which traditionally actually has no seafood in it, the Valencian rice. It's um, rice with rabbit, chicken, uh, and green beans. <laughs> but I personally love seafood in, in, uh, in my paella and they say that every Spanish mother has to have their own recipe. Um, so this is the place to get to know everything paella. We can take you to the rice fields, um, make a picnic of paella among the rice patties, learn how to make it yourself, um, go and visit the market and uh, maybe pick up some fresh, decide what you want in your paella that day and then go and cook it or have it prepared for you with a beautiful sea view. This is the place to eat and uh, and to just, uh, you might not want to look at another paella after a few days in Valencia. 
But Valencia is much more than just the paella. Um, it, of course, is was again one of the most important ports in Europe. Um, so exploring the historical quarters with our guides, understanding the history and the industry that uh, Valencia has had, and modern Valencia. This is the the city of arts and sciences, a project by Santiago Calatrava. Which, if you're not interested in science and architectural wonder in and of itself, absolutely worth a visit. But also um, home to incredible. Uh, uh, aquarium, uh, the Science Center, the Science Museum. It is really a unique project and something um, that should not be missed on any trip to Valencia. And of course, we have the beaches. Um, the beautiful Mediterranean beaches with the calm, warm waters right in the city and also surrounding. So you can get um, uh, spend the day exploring and then head out to the city beach or spend the day, uh, maybe drive an hour outside and find a secluded beach. Um, you, you, whichever is your speed, you can find it there in Valencia. All right, we're gonna end our little trip through Spain in the Balearic Islands today. So it's just a quick flight, you know, about 40 minute flight uh, from Madrid, or you can even take the ferry, an hour ferry from Valencia over to the Balearic Islands. The Balearic Islands are Ibiza, Formentera, Mallorca and Menorca. And of course, the reason to go to these islands are for their beaches. They have arguably the best coves in all of Europe. Um, again, some of the best ones are hard to reach and that's what we're there for. Uh, we absolutely suggest going out on a boat and having um, anchoring the boat in the little coves. And so you can swim and enjoy, maybe swim in to enjoy a fresh fish lunch in one of the beach shacks or beach clubs. Um, but this is a place that uh, it was some of the best sunsets in the world, those crystal clear waters. It has great um, weather all year round uh, and it is uh, just a really magical escape. And aside from the beaches, there are other natural wonders. This is a huge destination for hikers and bikers. We've got glorious mountains with these, this lunar landscape, the pine trees and lush greenery with the Mediterranean Sea behind. Uh, I'm not a biker or a hiker, but this absolutely motivates me to, to get out there. Um, and some of the best bikers in Europe coming to do the winding hilly roads, which is a fantastic place to train, but it's also great for beginners um, that we can set up with, with a hiking and biking guide to enjoy the natural wonders. And for the history buffs, not everyone's a beach person, so we can take you to the tiny towns of the islands like Valdemosa, uh, where Chopin had his home and was uh, one of his greatest inspirations. Or they, yeah, this tiny uh, city that's uh, carved out of rock in the middle of uh, Mallorca, or the Cathedral of Palma de Mallorca, which is one of the most uh, important pieces of architecture in Spain, and also um, an incredible example uh, to take you through the Catholic history of the islands as well. So that's all for me today. You know, Spain is, is uh, a small country, but full of things to do. So I just touched on a little bit. Um, and uh, uh, of course, any questions you have, I'm happy to answer them. And um, we would love to welcome you anytime. So thank you so much. Gracias, gracias. Thank you so much, Julia. It's it's uh, have covered a lot of territory, and it's it's uh, it's just going to be a matter, like you said, of choosing if there was that one uh, region that kind of um, you know um, resonated with you. Then uh, plan your plan your trip around that. Can you also just mention? Um, I know the the other thing is that Spain has a lot of festivals, like the Fallas Festival, Tomatina. You hear the running of the bulls. Um, is there? Um, can you just speak to those with the different times of year in that? Absolutely. Well, um, that's the thing. Is Spain is full of festivals, so uh, it really depends. Uh, there scattered throughout the times of the year or throughout the entire year. Um, but we do have uh, the most important is Las Vallas in Valencia in March. Um, and we have the San Fermín, the running of the bulls in July. Um, and we have La Tomatina, which I 
want to say it's in springtime, but it's escaping me right now. But um, so those are extremely important. Those are some things that now, unfortunately, have been suspended, but we're hoping that when things calm down, they'll pick back up. But that is, if you want to experience the Spanish fiesta and the Spanish just revere for their own history and traditions, they, coming for a festival is key to doing that. Also, Semana Santa, the Holy Week. Um, where you can see the processions, and especially in Andalusia, that is uh, a really uh, special experience to be had. I bet, I bet. And um, I know um, we were talking earlier, but maybe you can just mention what, like, what is your favorite time of year in Spain? Sure. So uh, my favorite time of year, and I think that of many of my colleagues, is is the off season. So that would typically be from November uh, to about April. Um, and we we enjoy temperate weather here. It's you know uh, like 22 degrees here in Madrid now, um, and sunny about 300 days of the year. And this is what in the summertime, everyone's at the beach, everyone is out enjoying everyone abandons their real life. It's also the Spain, a lot of people get the month of August off. So they just completely abandon <laughs> all of their duties and and head to the coast. So when you visit the cities, you're not experiencing the city as it is with people living in it. Where, whereas if you come in off season, everyone's back to your routine, you head to the local bars and the locals are going to be there enjoying their tapas right next to you. Um, and you're going to enjoy lower rates as well, which is fantastic, but just enjoying things with less crowds on a more calm and authentic level. Okay, perfect. Um, and just one other question about, is there a certain, like I know that um, the train system is pretty good, but is there certain uh, regions maybe in the north that you'd say it would be better to rent a car and drive or like yes. rather than others? Absolutely. So if you go to the north, I would definitely recommend uh, renting a car, especially in the Basque region that I mentioned. Um, that's full of tiny towns that are great to explore by car. And uh, a lot of them are a little more remote. Um, so that's that's a really nice, a nice area. And there are a lot of wineries as well. Um, so if you can have a designated driver to take you around, that's that's ideal. <laughs> um, but just keeping that in mind. And um, Andalusia in the south is another great place to to uh, to get around in car, by car to visit those whitewash village I told you about. Okay, okay, perfect. And what about, um, I know it's really um, popular, the Camino Trail. Mm -hmm. um, do you want, could you mention a little bit about that? Absolutely. So the Camino de Santiago, the St. James Way, um, it ends up in, in Santiago de Compostela. So that's on the western coast of Spain, the northwestern coast. And that's where the remains of St. James are said to be laid. So it's a pilgrimage for many people. It started, of course, as a Catholic pilgrimage, but now it's a spiritual pilgrimage for many people, regardless of religions. Uh, but the traditional way to walk it is from um, southern France all the way across northern Spain, uh, and it can take uh, six weeks or so to walk it. Um, one thing that our clients do a lot is start uh, maybe three days walking away from, from Santiago, and you can still get your pass, uh, your, your Camino passport stamped and say that you did it. Um, but it's a fantastic way to see the country because you're, you're going places that are unreachable by car, you're walking through there in places that most people miss. Um, also, this happens to be one of the best food and wine regions as well. So a lot of people welcoming the pilgrims into these tiny towns, welcoming you with great food and wine. You meet a lot of people along the way. Um, it is a really special experience and just the, 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 some of the most beautiful um, areas of Spain that you pass through. Amazing, perfect. Uh, I don't think I have any more questions. Rhonda, did, did that bring back some memories for you, those pictures? It sure did. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, and just some of the, I have to say that I spent a little time in Seville and um, one of the things that we did when we were there, not that I am a supporter in bullfighting by any means. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to go to a bullfight or anything like that, but I found it really interesting. We went outside of Seville and we uh, attended one of the ranches where they have the matador training. So the up and coming mm -hmm. matadors. And so we kind of met them, 
um, they explained what they do in the training process and, and, you know, how they do treat the bulls. And so it was actually really quite fascinating and just a little snippet of the history and, and, you know, the culture of why it started. So I thought that was actually quite fascinating and such a, um, a highlight really for that area. Cause I, I didn't want to go to a bullfight or any of that, yeah. but it was really quite fascinating. Absolutely. I'm, I'm the same as you. I'm pretty anti bullfighting, but uh, I mean, that's what we really strive to do is get to the root of it and understand where these things come from and understand just uh, everything that surrounds them. So going out to those ranches or something so special and also just to see the way that the bulls are revered and take, mm-hmm. they, I mean, they live quite an incredible life. Yes. Um, yes, before they they're they're go very, very, very well you. taken care of. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it is a very special experience. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's a country that I want to go back and explore so much more. And I've heard there's a place called Rhonda. <laughs> yes, there is. One so of I think my it's favorite a, a places. must visit for me. <laughs> Should be famous there. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Got to be famous somewhere. Might as well be in Spain. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Julia. It's such a pleasure to have you. And it's so nice that, um, you know, you can... I just love that your product is not generic, that, you know, you, you have all the inside information, the connections, just being able to sit with someone who's from the area and be able to, um, I think people are just really longing for those really authentic right. local experiences and, and getting to meet the people and just hear about their everyday life and, and just talk with them, I think is, um, is so important and just really gives depth to a place. So thank you for being able to, um, offer that and um yeah and just oh, share a little bit so about much. your country and yes. we're happy thank you. my pleasure yeah i can't wait to um come back and and send people there as soon as it's safe to do so and people are ready so um enjoy the rest of your evening thank you guys again all of our um guests who are, have joined us today thank you so much for your time um we love having you with us and we we'll look forward to um next week so enjoy the day and the evening, everyone. Thanks, Thanks so again, much. Julia. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.